uh, Rhonda has asked me to talk about biblical eldership. And um, as I do that, I'll, I will be holding up something to the screens. Uh, it's a few definitions of terms here. So I don't know, can you, when you see me on the screen, am I up in the corner or am, am I in the main box? You're in the main box, Scott. Okay, all right. That way everybody can see it. Well, I want to be a little autobiographical as we begin. Um, it's interesting how God works in a person's life. Um, I went through my whole uh, time of ministry and um, I, I never got a doctor. I never got my doctoral degree. And all my other friends were doing, you know, doctoral degrees and and um, this kind of thing. But I just didn't have a subject that galvanized my attention. I did not want to do it just to do it. So um, after I retired in 2011, uh, the next year, I got an invitation from Randy Clark and Global Awakening, big worldwide evangelistic healing ministry. And he was setting up a doctoral program at United Theological Seminary in Dayton and um, wanted to know if I was interested. So I called Randy. I knew Randy and I called him, talked to him about it. And um, it was on supernatural ministry. And I thought, whoa, I can get my head around this. Yeah. So I thought, I'm going to investigate this. I filled the information, the application out, sent it in, and I was accepted. And so we started, I was on the road to uh, uh, doing a further education. I hadn't done it for a long, long time, but, um, and a doctoral, any kind of doctoral program is a serious endeavor. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot to go through it. And, um, but I was excited and we did that. And um, I jumped on board and now here's, here's what's interesting. The seminary over there had just uh, kind of retooled and they had gone from kind of a traditional liberal theological seminary, Methodist seminary, to a Methodist seminary that was more charismatically disposed. I believed in the contemporary worship and renewal of the church. And uh, the, the uh, student roster was exploding. People were coming in. It was one of the fastest growing seminaries in the country. And everything was changing. It was so it was, it was pretty, it was an exciting atmosphere. So at any rate, the first day in class, here we are. Um, we, we had a general in sessions in the morning, plenary sessions. And then in the afternoon, we met with our, our doctoral advisor. And so in the morning sessions, you know, they're telling us about, well, you're on for a great journey and, uh, just sit back and, you know, relax a little bit. Don't get uptight about your dissertation because, you know, your doctoral thing is all about a dissertation. So don't worry about that. you got plenty of time to formulate and come up with what you want to do and all this kind of thing. And so I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is cool. So we get in the afternoon session with our doctoral advisor, Dr. John Ruthven. Uh, he was the main guy in, in uh Regent University School of Divinity he was ahead of their doctoral program over there, Virginia Beach. And at any rate, he he starts telling us, um, uh, "We've got a we you guys have got to know what you're going to uh, focus on soon." He said, "I want to before the end of the week, I want a three by five card with a paragraph on what you're going to do." And it's just the opposite of what I heard in the morning session. And I'm like, "Come on." because I didn't know exactly. A lot of the guys in the class were going to do something on healing, uh, some kind of a design for healing or whatever, and uh, protocol for healing for their local church or whatever. And as you know, the doctoral ministry program is a practical degree. So, um, and I just, I mean, I was the first day. I didn't know what I was going to do yet. And um, well, I went home that night and laid in bed and tossed and turned and sweated and I thought maybe maybe I should just pack it in. Maybe I'm just not you know up for this. And it seemed like a lot of the people in the class didn't know which direction they were going to go, but I didn't. So finally, I got to sleep, and God spoke to me in a dream or in 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 my sleep, and um, He said, "Biblical eldership." And I thought, "Wow, that's it! I can do it." because this is what I've done in my church. And so I know about this 
and it is a supernatural thing. And so I was really, really relieved and went back to class and filled my little card out. And boy, I was on the road for, for uh, doing a study, a doctoral study on biblical eldership. And, and um, so uh, I, I got to thinking about this and I, I wanted to read from, I'm going to read a few sections from my, from my book, which is basically my dissertation on this subject. And um, uh, this kind of, this kind of sets the tone for what was happening. It says, this book arises out of a single text in the Old Testament in which a breakthrough in proportional ministry propelled me on a catalytic journey beginning in the year 1984. Uh, Ten years into a successful appointment at the Trinity United Methodist Church in Pickerington, Ohio, uh, we grew from 60 people in morning worship to over 500, encompassing two morning worship services and an evening worship service. In the interim, the workload increased beyond my capacity to adequately meet. I cried out to the Lord for direction, and in short order, God took me to his word in Numbers chapter 11. So here we are, and um, the church has grown. We got, we got over 500 people coming. Uh, we, are com- we have people coming from over 16 different postal zones. I'm preaching the gospel. We're a charismatic United Methodist Church. The power of the Holy Spirit is moving like crazy. And the church is, you know, really growing. And all the church growth experts say, well, you know, once you get to a certain level, you have to add staff. And you have to have this staff and you have to have that staff. And we didn't really have the money for to hire a lot of people. And so I went to God. And um which is what we're supposed to do in life anyway. I really went to God. I got down on my knees. I prayed. I fasted. I said, Lord, what's, what gives? I need help in administration of this church. And I don't think I'm supposed to go out and hire a bunch of people. I, I'm asking you. And the Lord spoke to my heart, just as clear as it is. Uh, and he said, I want you to raise up elders in this church, and they're going to help you uh, preside over this congregation and superintend over this congregation and track the flock through spiritually. And so he took me to Numbers chapter 11, and uh, you probably are familiar with it, but I'm going to, I'm going to read Numbers 11. This is verse 16 and 17, because Moses was in a similar situation, only with a lot more headache and a lot more people. And Moses went to God because he couldn't handle it all. He needed help. And the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. And I will come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit which is upon you, and I will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. And I thought, wow, this is exactly what I need. So um, this is what Moses did. He went and um, he went. He went and drew people out of the great rabble, that great congregation. Not just anybody, not an eeny, meeny, miny, mo, but people who knew that already had the Spirit of God on them, that had leadership potential on them. And so then we find from in um, verses 24 and 25 of Numbers chapter 11, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around about the tent. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him, And took some of the spirit that was upon him and put it upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not, but they did so not more. So God fulfilled his his, um, promise to 
uh, Moses and Moses set up the elders and the elders helped him to administrate. And so I thought, okay, that's great. Now, how do I do it here in my situation? And um, so I sought the Lord again and God gave me a design that is so simple, but yet will work in any, in any church context doesn't matter what the denomination, non-denomination, doesn't what, what your leadership protocol is, this will work. And um, what I did was I, I went to, because we didn't have a board of elders, we, I went to some, uh, a few of the leaders in the church that were on a, a couple different committees and shared it with them, said, what do you think? And they said, it sounds like a good idea. So I preached on it on a Sunday morning. And what preached on this passage from Numbers chapter 11, talked about eldership, talked about how I needed help, talked about how God had put within our congregation all of the gifts that we need to bring that congregation to fulfillment in Christ. And that uh, I wanted to appoint uh, elders. And I went through the whole thing and did teaching on eldership from this scripture. At the end of the service, I passed out three by five cards gave one to every person in attendance. I said, now, as a result of what you've heard, I want you to put at least one name on this card of a person in our church that you feel would be elder material for this congregation. So little did I know that this gave people ownership. I didn't really, hadn't thought this through. I was just following what the Lord said, but it did give ownership to the whole thing because uh, everybody put a name or two on their card. They passed all the cards in. I collected the cards. I went through the names, some of which I knew some of the names that would be on there. And I began to pray and fast. And I began to ask the Lord, okay, Lord, which one of these do you want to begin with? And God showed me a particular a man in our church that had a, he was, he was, he was Catholic, but he'd been coming to our church and had dramatic conversion experience. And um, God said, he's the one you start with. So I talked to uh, Brother Pat, and he came, and, and, um, and the two of us got together and started meeting, started praying. And uh, we asked the Lord, um, okay, show us two more. We have two now. Show us two more. And so the Lord showed us two more people from those names on those cards. And uh, we asked them to join the elders. I had a form that I had made out uh, detailing what what it would, in, would entail in being an elder. And um, so that went out, and um, they joined. And so now we've got four. And so now I had the four of them together, and uh, we began to pray and fast and, and ask for two more. And uh, we kept doing that pattern for several months until we got about 11 or 12 elders, and then we stopped. And um, I explained to these people that the purpose of the elders are to help the, they're to pray for the pastor, pray with the pastor, and to help administrate on a spiritual level, help to discern the spiritual movement of the church and what God wanted us to do and how he wanted us to do it. So we're talking about a plurality of leadership here. And if you look in the New Testament, you'll find that the New Testament church definitely is run by a plurality of leadership. It's not a one-man show. And so this, I had never done anything like this before, but it seemed like this was, this was God. And so we did it. And uh, as a result of that, um, we... Um, I, I could say that this was probably the most important decision I made in all the years of my ministry because I worked with these men. They happen to be all men, but they wouldn't have to be. I do in my dissertation, I have a whole section on women and how God has opened the, up this thing that there's no longer uh, Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ. And But it happened to be all men in this case because the congregation had been strongly um, uh, female-led, female-oriented, and God wanted to have the men begin to step up to the plate. And so it worked out well. And um, 
I begin to pour myself into these men, studying the Bible, showing them, leading them about eldership and leadership and, and so on and so forth. And um, we got into uh, all kinds of things. We would meet on a Monday night and uh, we'd meet to pray and to share and things like this. Uh, we would have people come in, schedule. Some of some were from our congregation. Some were not from our congregation. Some were from the Columbus area. Some were from even farther out in Ohio would come in. People who had challenges, problems, sick people, people dying of cancer, people going through divorces, people strung out on drugs, all kinds of things. They would come in with those elders and we'd sit with us and we would minister to them and uh, hear, their, hear their situation and we would get discernment from the Holy Ghost. And it was so amazing how God worked in those elders. Um, I had on one occasion, I got my professor to come up here to Columbus because he was not quite understanding my whole um, elder paradigm here and so uh, Lord told me to ask him to come up and, and uh, actually attend an elders meeting. And this is what he says on the back of my book about that experience. He says, a few years ago, Dr. Kelso invited me as, as his doctor of ministry dissertation advisor to observe 11 elders ministering in a difficult counseling session. The men did not appear to be more or less than a cross section of men from the community but they operated with jaw-dropping spiritual insight and effectiveness. The cooperation, the humility, the deference to each other and toward the counselees was breathtaking. I never thought that 11 average laymen could work together so smoothly and effectively toward a genuinely satisfactory outcome. If I were skeptical that elders could function in this way, that skepticism was put to rest that afternoon. My recurring thought as a professional minister and counselor was, these men are so incredibly well trained. This experience lent great credibility to Dr. Kelso's project, the material you're about to read. I believe it works not only because he developed a highly effective method for training church elders, but also because Kelso's method is grounded on the best grasp of the biblical principles I have ever seen. If the, root, if the reader truly seeks to follow the central New Testament mandate to make disciples, and in this case, elders, then biblical eldership is the place to start. So that's on the back cover of my book, pretty good rep, uh, recommendation. And uh, I know it was from the heart, he really meant it. And so, uh, we, um, this was uh, such a wonderful um, experience in my life and my ministry, and we just saw all kinds of people healed and delivered. Uh, these, are, these are situations that I couldn't have just done by myself. Um, I mean, we had a guy, we brought a guy in one time that was, wanted to get involved with our youth ministry, and, and we let him get involved in youth ministry, and he was a sexual predator, and he was hitting on girls. And um, this became, you know, as weeks and months went by, a real problem. And we had talked to him about it, but he didn't stop. Finally, we brought him into the, the elders one night and had a showdown. And now, you know, I couldn't have done that by myself in my office calling him in. It would not have been the same. It wouldn't carry the weight. But you walk in a room with 12 men who are filled with the Holy Ghost, who have the church's best interest at heart, and who know how to minister in the gifts of the, of the Holy Spirit, confront that spirit that was in him, I want to tell you, that made a difference. And so that was the kind of practical thing that happened as a result of having elders. They covered, you know, basically covered my butt many times. And, um, but it's a New Testament, it's a New Testament thing. And so, um, you know, this, this was a great experience. Um, after I graduated, um, I got some calls from uh, pastors around the nation. I know well, not too long after I graduated, a, a Spirit-filled Methodist pastor down in Livingston, Tennessee, that was part of our Aldersgate network, uh, Aldersgate network of Spirit-filled churches across the country. Um, he had 
gained uh, pretty much of a reputation as a you know a pretty powerful preacher and charismatic preacher and been in his church many years and he was looking for you know kind of a shot in the arm or something and he read about this my my project and everything and he had he invited us to come down so I and my head elder went down there for a weekend retreat to train their people they all bought the book and read the book and and then we spent a weekend um, in, in training on biblical eldership, how it worked, how it would help the church. Um, and um, then I preached on Sunday morning and left. And then I left and I said, OK, Craig, it's yours. Take it from here. And uh, he applied these principles in his church, raised up biblical eldership. And he told me, Scott, he said, Scott, it now this is a powerful spirit filled church. He said, I want to tell you, Scott, this transformed our church. It lit a fire in our church like we have not ever seen before. And so um, this really, really works. And um, so it was pretty cool. And um, it's an opportunity uh, to, to check it out. I mean, the books on Amazon, of course, and Barnes and Noble and that kind of thing. I have copies here too in Pickerington, but um, <clears throat> so we want to define some terms. And um, I want to I want to share with you the three. Um, let's see. How do I get my? Well, maybe you can see. Can y'all? Can they see this, uh, Brandon? Hey, Brandon, are you there? We can see it. Okay, you can see yeah, it. Yeah, they can see it. We can see it. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, I'm going to share with you the three basic terms <clears throat> around eldership, because I remember preaching one time and I was uh, doing a word study on this and I was. Hey, Scott, looking, yes. Do you have do you have a, like a uh, PowerPoint on this? Uh, no, I don't. OK. Yeah. No, this is just a one sheet that I'm going to use real briefly. OK. Um, <clears throat> but. So I, I, I was doing this word study, and I was looking up the Greek words for elders, bishops, shepherds, and they were all kind of flowing together. And um, man, it was confusing. And there were page after page of, of how, how these, different, these different entities worked in a local setting. So we just want to define these, these terms here. The first one here is elder which in Greek is the word presbytros, presbytros. It refers to a person that has maturity, respect, wisdom for rulership, preaching, and watch care. Um, it also refers to a person that has experience in life and is probably in most cases uh, on the older end of the age spectrum. Okay, now, that's not the only qualification, but that in most cases was a qualification. So you've got the word elder in the in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 14, Paul said he went around preaching to all the different churches and setting elders in place in those churches. The second term is the term bishop or episcopus. Um, the Greek word episkopos, bishop, means overseer, superintendent, guard, or someone who watches over. So a bishop kind of is, is an overseer. And the Bible says that Jesus is the bishop and, uh, and uh, author of our faith. Uh, but we, we see that this role is one of the roles in leadership in the early church. The third term that all these kind of flow together and I'll explain that, but the third term is shepherd. And the Greek is pomenean, which means someone who feeds, guides, guards, and protects. So you've got, you've got elder, you've got bishop, you've got shepherd. And, um, what I want to say is that uh, that these terms, all three of these terms, were used interchangeably uh, 
in the first century, in the first century up to church up to 100 AD, okay? And we're going to read a passage of scripture where we see uh, how they're interchangeable. So, um, but what happens, what happens is that the, um, the early church believed that Jesus was coming back. Paul believed it, and Peter believed it, and the other people believed that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. And so they didn't really set in place um, uh, leadership for a long term. And when Jesus didn't come back, and the church kept growing and going on into the second century, they realized that they needed a leadership structure for all of these churches that were growing and expanding throughout Asia Minor, uh, that they had to set in place people who would have been functioning in a local setting to be functioning in a more of a regional setting, if that makes sense. And what they landed on was the was the designation bishop or episcopos, which had an overseeing kind of superintending watching over gift. And um, so, you know, this happened like in the, in the Catholic church, the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. He is one of many bishops in, in, in the um, Catholic church, but he is the main bishop because the Bishop of Rome was the seat of the whole religion. And um, that was that was a uh, development through history that came from these from these from these three designations. So I want to read a scripture that talks about all three of them, because uh, my dissertation was uh, based on two different scriptures. Uh, the main one was there in in, uh, in uh, Numbers chapter eleven with Moses, but the second one was from the New Testament, and it is from 1 Peter chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 5. And so I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version in uh, New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. So it says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. Now this is Peter speaking, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Tend the flock of God that is your charge, not by constraint, but willingly, not for shameful gain, gain but eagerly, not as domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd is manifested, you will obtain the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you that are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will exalt you. So we see in this scripture um, some of the uh, emphasis, some of the duties of those who preside over the local church. And these, these uh, scriptures are read in... Um, uh, these these terms are read in this scripture, and I refer to it in my in in my dissertation that they have um, uh, uh, the cluster cluster of vocabulary of images: elders, overseers, exercise oversight, and um, they're used interchangeably. I guess is what I'm trying to say. All three of these terms: uh, bishop, elder, and and the shepherd are used in this in this one scriptural passage, and they're used interchangeably. So Peter saw himself as a bishop, referred to him, was referred, but also as an elder and as a shepherd. And um, this seems to be the pattern throughout the first century. By the time you get into the second century, like I said, things begin to shift, and um, there are more, some of these... Uh, designations are set in place 
as kind of like an office in the church. Now, um, I'm from the United Methodist Church, and so we have, we're on what we call an Episcopal system. That is, we have bishops, elders, and deacons. Um, not all churches are set up that way, but ours is. It's a biblical, it's, it's a biblical um, structure, but yet the local church is not as biblical as the, as the general church is, because in the Methodist Church, the pastors are the elders. And you're ordained to, uh, to you're ordained to three things: word, sacrament, and order. And so you become the elder. But now, as I've done my study and my doctorate, I find out that the it goes a little farther than that in the New Testament. So I don't really see a lot of churches set up on a on a New Testament basis. That's why I call the subtitle of my church "Back to the Future" with spirit-filled leadership. In the local church, we're going back to the future and bringing this into the modern day church. And um, it really is, it really is uh, done well, and, and the Lord blesses it. And so um, we see a convergence of, of some of these of terms, and I'll I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But um, in my in my um, my study, my dissertation. I wanted to test for um, I wanted to test for three or four different um, things that I was trying to get at, and um, let's see if I can find this here. Um, in setting up air and setting up elders, what I did was I picked five different churches within a 200 mile or 150 mile radius of the seminary, uh, churches who did not have elders in place. And um, so some were black churches, some were white churches, some were county seat churches, some were any inner city church. It was really a nice mix. I had five churches. And what I was measuring was, um, I was measuring on the effect of elders on salvation, healing, deliverance, and what we call prayer counseling, which is uh, inner healing, which is part of deliverance. And so that's what I was measuring for. And um, then there were also some auxiliary things that we were measuring for. And... Um, uh, we called them component variables and uh, such things as encouragement to the pastor, personal accountability among the elders, congregational stability, um, and growth in intimacy with God. So those are some auxiliary things that uh, we were also uh, setting up and, and, and uh, trying to measure for. And it was a really interesting time because every one of these churches who had never had elders, I took them through the design and they, they, uh, they set up elders in their, uh, their own churches according to this design that God had shown me and began ministering. And um, this all happened over about a nine month period so that, you know, we had, we could triangulate the, the results and, that we could we could measure before they set up elders. We could measure as they were set up being setting up elders, and and monitoring it as it was going along. And then finally, after they set up elders and the effect, and it was it was so interesting to hear the the results of um, these churches and what had happened. One of the churches, one of the guys, is on our our steering committee for our apostolic network, Brandon, that's uh, Sam Adiami. He went through it and um, set up elders as a result of this and really helped him, really helped his church in, in terms of uh, governing and, and presiding over uh, the church. And so it was, it was, a, it was a great opportunity that I, I'd had and it was given to me by the Lord and um, so it seemed uh,
But what was the interesting thing as I was measuring for these four basic components of salvation and uh, healing, deliverance, and prayer counseling, uh, there were these four auxiliary areas. There were four auxiliary areas that I was also testing for, and they were um, anointing in ministry, healing, uh, Let's see, number one, anointing in ministry. Number two, humility. Number three, confidence in ministry. And number four, expectation in ministry. And what happened was that the four auxiliary areas actually flipped with the main areas. And the auxiliary areas became the most important in the results of the study. And the four main areas I was test testing for were became more auxiliary and out of those four that flipped humility the whole idea of humility in leadership and in service became the number one attribute for success in ministry in an elder's ministry and i thought man this is really something to, and so I started studying humility and preaching on humility. And I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's all through the Bible. Um, and it is, is um, very important for successful ministry is the pursuit of humility. What's humility? Well, it's, it, it, it encompasses several things, but it's such things as I'm eager to learn. Okay. If you have a humble spirit, you will be eager to learn. You will be a disciple. You will be a learner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing that's attached to humility is that you're respectful of authority, that you don't try to usurp, uh, usurp authority from other people, that you don't try to take authority that's not yours, but you are respectful of authority and that you know where you're at in the chain of authority in the kingdom of God. Um, that's an attribute of humility. Another attribute of humility is fear of God. I preached one time on the fear of God at Trinity back in the 1980s, and um, I got so caught up in it that I preached 16 weeks without stopping straight. It took me about three months, three or four months, and um, every aspect of fear of God that I could think about, and um, I'm going to have a little bit about that in my new book. And uh, by the way, Brandon, just so you know, I started a new book. And um, that's awesome, Scott. Yeah, I started on uh, July 31st. I'd had, I had to have the title and the chapter, the chapter titles and everything for quite some time. And I was making notes now and then, but I just never got off uh, ground zero there. And then finally, I was talking to one of my friends on the phone the other day over in Pennsylvania, and he was telling me, he said, you know, your book, Biblical Eldership, he said, that is the most practical book I have ever read on biblical eldership and setting it up. And he said, I have recommended that book to so many people. I thought, man, the Spirit of God hit me when he said that. It was like God said, start your next book. And so, I'm doing that. So that's just a little side note. So um, let me just say, uh, how are we doing on time, Ronan? We're doing good, Scott. You're doing good. You're awesome. Okay. Um, I want to, I'm not going to go a whole lot longer, but I want to read a few other things. And um, so that you get an idea about how, broad this thing of eldership is and uh, on page 63 in my book in the second paragraph i want to start there and just read a little bit about the importance of eldership in the history of the world in terms of leadership it says we begin by saying that leadership <coughs> by a council of elders is a form of government found in nearly every society of the ancient near east it was the foundational government structure of the nation of Israel throughout its Old Testament history, Exodus 3.16, Ezra 10.8. For Israel, a tribal patriarchal society, the eldership structure was as basic as the family. 
And so, in fact, it, it's still used in the world today, 2,000 years later, and tribal society is all over the world. Most of the world is tribal. And um, you have an eldership breakdown that's still giving leadership to, to all kinds of groups of people in Pakistan, Afghanistan, all over the world. So <clears throat> then I go and it says, so when the New Testament records that Paul, a Jew who was records that Paul, who was a Jew, was thoroughly immersed in the Old Testament Jewish culture, appointed elders for his newly found churches, Acts 14.23. It means that he established a council of elders in each local church. As a result, we recognize from the outset the Jewish roots to the pattern of eldership in New Testament churches. However, the New Testament pattern for eldership did not purely come from an Old Testament template superimposed by Jesus. There were similarities, but also many differences, some which we'll cover later. As we consider the nuances of leadership designation called elders in the New Testament church, we must remember that the leadership constructs came directly from Jesus Christ and not from tradition. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. <clears throat> Paul in Ephesus speaks of our common access to the Father through the Holy Spirit, with being a household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In other words, the 12 apostles were the governmental and foundational supervisors of the early church. In a natural progression through time, their leadership was turned over to local church leaders who became the local ruling authorities, servants, elders in the local church. It is, however, important to realize that the designation elder is always in the plural. This is, this is important. The designation of elder is always in the plural form when tied to church ministry. So it's not elder, it's elders. Even though no set number of elders is mentioned, and the designation church is always in the singular form when tied to the ministry of elders in a particular city. That's why Paul wrote his letters to the church at Ephesus, to the church at um, uh, uh, Philippi. He wrote his church to the city, or his letters to the church of a city, because that church is singular. There was one church in each city. There's only one church in Columbus, Ohio, it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so we're a part of that. So, so when speaking of um, plurality of leadership, uh, we're talking about, um, uh, we're definitely speaking of, of a plurality of leadership who met specific moral and spiritual qualifications before they could serve that's from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. Those are the basic parameters for an elder or leader in the church who were publicly examined by the church as to these qualifications, 1 Timothy 3.10, who were publicly installed in office, 1 Timothy 5.22, and who were empowered by the Holy Spirit to do their work. This pattern of shared leadership is consistent throughout the New Testament. Furthermore, the team effort of leadership includes, but is not limited to, oversight and management, preaching and teaching, protecting the church from false teachers, exhorting and admonishing the church as to sound doctrine, visiting the sick and praying for healing, judging doctrinal issues, and dealing with church discipline and apostasy. So you can see how important that the structure of an eldership is in a local church. I'm not talking about trustees. You know, there's a place for the trustees, but we're not talking about the trustees who are presiding over the building and the grounds and this kind of thing. I'm not talking about an administrative board. I'm talking about a group of men who can discern the spirit in the heart of God for a local church and move that local church in an anointing and in a direction that will be absolutely um, successful. And this is what we're looking at uh, with biblical eldership, and, and this is what will happen and take place.
So um, now, as we say that, you might you might be saying, well, where's well, where's the pastor come into all this? And um, I'm glad you asked that because <laughs> First Timothy five seventeen sets the pace for the elder gifted with pastoral graces. First Timothy five seventeen says, "Let the elders who rule well be considered of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and in teaching." Okay, so the thought here is that the pastor is one of the elders, but not all the elders have the same gifts. They don't all have the same training. They don't all have the same uh, anointing in terms of leadership and calling that, that maybe the pastor does. And so there's a place where we call, I have in the book that explains it, that's been used throughout Christian history as first among equals, okay? And this is a particular gift package that the pastor has that makes them eligible, eligible for a strategic function in the body of Christ, being a pastor. Now, there remains ample precedent in the New Testament for first among equals within the ranks of the apostles and disciples. The concept is demonstrated among Jesus' disciples in Luke 8.51, Luke 9.28, and Mark 14.33 with respect to Peter, James, and John. Among these three, Peter is the first among equals. In four separate lists of disciples, Peter's name is first, Matthew 10, 2 through 4, Mark 3, 16 through 19, Luke 6, 4 through 16, and Acts 1, 13. In addition, in all four Gospels, Peter is the prominent figure among the twelve. Jesus charged Peter at one point to strengthen your brothers, Luke twenty-two thirty-two. 32. Paul also encourages Peter, James, and John as pillars of the church in Jerusalem. And that's Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. And, uh, and so I have a Uh, furthermore, the pattern of first among equals continues to hold true with the appointment of deacons, and diaconia, the Greek word is diaconia, deacons, which means service or attendance as a servant. In Acts chapter 6, even though there were seven appointed to serve tables, the two who seemed to be prominent were Philip and Stephen, Acts 6, 8 through 7, 60. As we continue, we see the concept evidence with the apostle Paul and Barnabas who were commissioned together for the first missionary journey from the church in Antioch, Acts 13. The sequence begins by recording Barnabas's name first, but as time goes on, Paul rises to the top prominence with his name being first. If this isn't enough, after Peter leaves Jerusalem, James becomes the senior elder shepherd in Jerusalem and presides over and closes the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. So we see that there is precedence uh, uh, for this whole concept of uh, first among equals. Um, in, in fact, there were examples of this in the chief priests among the priesthood, Luke 9, 22. There were chief Pharisees among the Pharisees, Luke 14, 1. There were chief rulers among the synagogue, Acts 18.8. There were chief apostles among the apostles, 2 Corinthians 11.5 and 12.11. There were chief musicians in the tabernacle of David who were also chief of the Levites, 1 Chronicles 15.22, Psalm 4, 5, and 6. Uh, Michael is called the chief archangel amongst the angelic orders, Daniel 10.13. And uh, I could go on. So there's precedent for that. And, and so, you know, God has, God makes the rules and um, all we do is follow after them and, and try to uh, say that uh, we're trying to be the best that we've, we're, we've been appointed to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so just a few more things here about um, biblical eldership. 
and um, some of the parameters that I wanted to, and then maybe we could open up for, for questions. Um, but we see that um, these elders are, are there to um, to discern the will of God for a local church and to take a local church from point A to point B and then from point B to point C. <clears throat> and the reason this is important, this is so important is because the local church has to know what its calling is. Now we all have a general calling and that is to be salt and light in the community. Uh, we're, we're, to, uh, we're to win people and disciples people into the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, verse 16 through 20. This is the main mandate of the church. But yet at the same time, every church can't do everything. Every church can't be a, a, a promoter and excellent in worship, be a promoter excellent in mission, be promoter and excellent in discipleship, be promoter and excellent in, say, education. I mean, it goes on and on and on. So we have to have a mandate from God. What is the focus of this local church and how are we going to go about um, working that focus so that we can be a part of the bigger church and the larger church, the kingdom of God, and that we can function so that all God's work is getting done. So that, that pretty much is the overview of what I wanted to say tonight. And, um, so I don't know, Brandon, if you want to open it up or any questions. Yeah, or... yeah. Um, if anybody uh, would like to ask, if anybody would like to ask God any questions pertaining to uh, this um, vital subject in the church, I mean, we we definitely, uh, my, my thoughts, Scott, as you're sharing is... Um, that the thing that the church needs to repent of uh, coming out of COVID-19 and in this crisis uh, is that um, we need to get back to the biblical expression of, of, of the church. Okay. And, uh, and, and we've, we've got away from it. Yes. You know, I remember, um, I was being um, asked to be ordained or asked to be a part of an apostolic network a couple of years back, back before GCAN. Okay. And, and a man um, that the man that wanted to uh, wanted me to be a part of his apostolic network and ordain me an apostle. Um, I said, um, you know, um, I said the uh, the Bible and the scriptures, um, the name, the title wasn't before the uh, the name in Paul's um, writings. I said, what if we did not uh, emphasize the titles, but emphasized uh, the actual character of the person and the gentleman? It was somebody, you know. I'll we're named nameless. He, he doesn't live in my region, but uh, it's somebody of regions away. He said, uh, well, 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 we, we're, we're following an ecclesiastical order that uh, that we have uh, adopted from this organization. I said, well, what about the scripture? <laughs> and and uh, I could not get him to a to 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 line up with scripture as I was sh showing him, uh, uh, and 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 what it it really um, grieved me that that we become so uh, religious and so uh, we've gotten so far away from scripture and don't have a desire to to get back. What do you think about that, <laughs> Scott? Well, it's. <clears throat> I, I've seen it all through my life, and um, you know we become we become a part of organizations to uh, in order to uh, meet goals and to track through our our lives and 
and make, uh, but the organization of man do not account to the mandates of God. And yeah. So I think that we've got to stay with the scripture. And there's, that's why when I did this whole project on eldership, I thought, you know, back to the future, we can go back. This thing morphed from the second century to the third century to the fourth century. It morphed into something that was, that would have been unrecognizable to the people in the new Testament in the first yeah. century. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's kind of the history of man, but but we can, by the Spirit of God, get back to the original intent of God. And and I believe that that's, you know, how it worked in, in my situation here. And I think if we apply that to every other area of our life, uh, we'll find that the Bible is is absolutely right. Yeah. In, in, in every area of our life. Yeah. So there's a question here. Um, how does the elders function as it relates to the founder's prophetic direction? Um, and I'm not sure uh, the context of that founder's prophetic direction. Um, what is me? Maybe you can help with that, Scott. Um, how does the elders function as relates to the founder's prophetic direction? Well, uh, I think the question would assume that the founder is the person who started the church. Yeah. Um, so like in my situation, you know, I didn't start the church. The church was there. I was appointed by a bishop to serve that church. So I came from the outside and I was the next pastor in line to serve the church. Um, but I was kind of like a founding pastor because the church was so small, it was a little country church, and, and it had it, it been that way since 1866, and then it really began to mushroom under my leadership by the grace of God, and so it, it bloomed into a large regional church of, of six to 800 people, and, and so that was, I was considered, you know, more of a founding, but I think the question assumes that a pastor or somebody who founds a church okay. has a has a particular vision yeah and how does that person get a group of elders to come along with that vision so how, how does that how do they well if i could tell you that i can make a lot of money right now <laughs> <laughs> well what would happen is the founder has to always be open to direction from the spirit of god okay because god may change it up along the way you may yeah. start out you know in one venue or in one channel but then god changes it yeah that, that's what israel is all about you know they follow the cloud by by day and the pillar of fire by night and yeah when god stop they stop and when god move forward they move forward so the founder has to has to not be so locked tight that they can't be open to what the others that are around him or her um, have have to uh, feed into the whole thing. Yeah. Good. Good. Anybody else? I'm not. I don't see a, any other questions. So, um, uh, but yeah. uh, yeah. go ahead. I have one. I'm Salo Five on there. Okay. Yeah. What, did you put it in there already? Yeah, my question's up there. Yeah, you think. Okay. Up what was the second categories oh, tested? Yeah. Anointing, humility, confidence, and and all in ministry. Oh. Um, let's see if I can find that. Um, there were four categories. Uh, let's see. Give me a minute.
Yeah, this has been so good, Scott, man. I uh, I really sense um, August a kind of like a, a launching of a new beginning uh, with the with the church of the living God in the earth. And um, it just hit me even as you were sharing that we, we talk about repentance, that the church needs to repent mm. almost in a nebulous way. Like, um, you know, like there is no, um, you know, repentance focus except for the broad category of, we need to repent of our sin or our prayerlessness or so on and so forth. But um, I think our our prayerlessness and our, um, you know, uh, straying away from God is, is tied to our straying away from scripture in our expressions of our, um, our, our churches in this generation. And, and so uh, we have all kinds of other criteria that, are, that is in place from man as to what a successful church looks like and, uh, and how to go up the ranks in, in, in a particular, um, you know, organization or, you know, how to become known in a, in a, in a worldly sense. And, and, and we've gotten away from actually uh, God's uh, purpose and plan of the church. And I think we, we need to repent from, uh, for, for getting away from scripture in our expression of the church. And so, yes. you know, it, it really, it's dawning on me, even as you were sharing tonight, how important and vital it is that that we get back to the word of God. And, uh, and like you said, go back to the, uh, your, back to the future. Yeah. I found those four, those four auxiliary, um, components that became the main testing for the project. And they are number one, anointing in ministry. Number two, humility. Number three, confidence in ministry. And number four, expectation in ministry. Mm. So all those things rose to the top when, when the elders of these churches started actually functioning as elders and ministering. That's what they, those were the areas that really became prominent. Sam again, Sam again Scott. Yeah, uh, anointing in ministry. They, they realized that there was anointing when they came together to do the work of the kingdom of God in a local church, along with the pastor, that they were met with an anointing they'd never had before. Uh, then humility was uh, another one, which actually became the strongest one. And we talked about those components of humility, but basically, you know, um, moving as a group and respecting the person next to you, respecting their gift, and let their gift come forth when it's needed in a particular counseling situation or let them back off in your gift. So it's deferring to one another. So that humility, and then there's confidence in ministry that they had confidence that God was going to do something every time they met. That it wasn't just a meeting, but they were, you know, God was shifting things in the spiritual heavenlies when they were ministering to people. And the fourth thing was expectation in ministry which I think this is really important. You know, when we come into the house of God, like on a Sunday morning, Brandon, there ought to be expectation, not only yeah. from the preacher, but from the house. The people yeah. out there expecting that something is going to happen, that God's going to yeah. blow the roof off that place. That's a real big component. Yeah. Okay, so Scott, um, her question I, was, was that fourth... Uh, um, was the second um, tested? Was the second category tested? And what was the um, what was the results of the test? Um, the results were well. The the general results were that um, 
that biblical eldership, um, let's see if I can find it here in my, in, it's right in the beginning. Um, okay, this is what I tested for. So the originally a doctor ministry project entitled Raising Up Biblical Eldership and its Implications for Charismatic Ministry in the Local Church. The purpose of this study was to develop and test a template to call and disciple a group of leaders in the local church who function as elders, exercising spiritual oversight in congregational ministry after the pattern in Numbers chapter 11 and 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. So I used a qualitative framework utilizing a comparison of a pre-test and a post-test participant journal and exit interviews. The major themes emerging from the study were confidence in ministry, expectation in ministry, anointing in ministry, and humility. The data indicates a transformative effectiveness in ministry relative to elders being called to serve in leadership. So that's what, that's what the outcome of the project was that actually demonstrated, this project demonstrated an, a, a transformative effectiveness in mm. ministry relative to raising up these biblical elders. Your Jesus. church become much more effective if you've got it, if you have biblical elders. elders. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Scott. How can they get the book? Um, it is, it's on Amazon or it's on um, Barnes and Noble, or I, I have uh, some copies here in Pinkerton too. That okay. If they hey, want can, to can I ask one question? I put in the notes. Yes. Okay. Um, I just, uh, Scott, thank you so much. You're welcome. He froze. Are you there, Glenn? His picture froze. <laughs> Glenn. Okay. Oh, Scott, he asked about um, fivefold ministry. I'm I'm still looking for it. Oh yeah. How does elders relate to fivefold? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, that's there a good, it is. yeah, that's a good question. Um, the five, the fivefold ministry, is kind of a broader category than eldership because the fivefold is to bring the church to maturity, according to Ephesians chapter four. That's uh, it's given as a gift to the church to bring the church to maturity in Christ. So. You know, we talk about those fivefold offices, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, that those, all of those were set in place in the New Testament era, era, but not all of them continued throughout Christian history. In fact, it's amazing what we've done, how much we've done in the Christian church with just pastors and teachers, because mm. that's what we've had for the last 500 years anyway since the Reformation, we've had pastors and teachers. Mm. But now, just in the last 30 years, God is adding back to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists. We've had some evangelists in the past, but but um, especially the apostles and the prophets yeah. who are given, you know, to a vital ministry, exercising a vital ministry uh, for the larger church, for the big picture. Yeah. And uh, we haven't had that for 500 years. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a wild ride from here on out because we're going to really be getting some serious discernment. Amen. Yeah. Is that good, Glenn? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm down at Hilton Head and last day of vacation here and I lost the, the signal, but I'll, I'll catch it on the replay. But I, somebody asked me what my title was over says, and I told them I was an unprofitable, I was an unprofit, an unprofitable <laughs> servant, according to Luke eleven nineteen. He says, you know, I'm only doing my duty because here in the South, especially people are concerned about their titles. Oh, and yeah. The titles are really functions. They're not titles. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. They're functions. 
Right. So I, I didn't hear the beginning of it, but I'm just assu assuming that, you know, do you feel that every church, so the, the, the elders can be apostle, they can be fivefold ministry, but does it necessitate every church to have a fivefold in that? And I, I'm sorry, because I just lost, I had to get another device here to hear what you said. I apologize. But does, does, does the elders, you, you know, I mean, is it, is it something, is it worthy to have that you should have in a full expression besides the pastor in the church of fivefold or do the elders take that part that's my that was my question sorry yes yeah it's a very good question and there's 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 debate on that that issue but i think that um from my perspective i think a local church would do well to have as much of the fivefold in place as possible um we know the the because we when you look at the life of Jesus, I don't have it right here before me, but I could show you where uh, every one of those fivefold designations were operative in Jesus' life: the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. He functioned in all of them. So Jesus is our high priest and our example. And if he's our example, then we could shoot for that too. Okay. What do you Amen. think, Ronnie? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, you, uh, you have so eloquently explained and shared uh, on this subject, um, and uh, we are appreciative. We've been all week reimagining the church Ooh, wow. uh, because, because we believe that the Lord um, wants his church to arise out of this crisis um, different than when when we came into this crisis and, and so um i i don't know that um we've ever had a time in history uh, definitely not in my lifetime where the church worldwide uh was in the midst of a global pandemic and it completely was shut down um uh in in the way that has happened over the last um eight months uh, right. five or six months. And so um, it, it's a wake up call for for us all. And I, I believe that um, uh, out of this crisis, uh, we have to reevaluate what we're doing and, and 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 what works as far as the word of God and scripture and where and get back to that. Yes. And 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 those things that we've been doing have drawn crowds or in some situations in some cases though those things were um you know organizationally put into a particular uh institution denominational we've got to we've got to get back to biblical effectiveness come on in, in what god actually seen his church as in a in a region as salt and light and uh, if we don't, the church will actually become obsolete. And as uh, the issues have gone back and forth over these times, non-essential. Yes. And, and so um, right. we, we thank you, Scott. And, uh, and we are, I'm excited to be running with you and to, uh, to be submitted to your leadership in Columbus, Ohio, and, uh, and all the things that God is doing in our city. Amen. And so and so if you guys want to uh, sow into Scott, as I said earlier, I asked him, we were together earlier today and I asked him, so, God, so Scott, you have Cash App, you have PayPal, how can we bless you? <laughs> and he said, I don't have none of that. No, man, you can help me set it up. <laughs> I will, Scott, I, I'll do that. I thought about that this afternoon. I should have just... Together. I should have just did it then. <laughs> but uh, if you guys uh, want to, so um, I, um, I I will actually get the monies that you give uh, to him uh, through either PayPal or um, Cash App. Okay. Uh, to you, Scott. Thank and, you. Uh, and we th again, we thank you. All right, um, get your communion elements and we're gonna close uh, with communion um, tonight. Um, as we've done every night, um, we close our evening devotion with communion.
We thank God for today and what God has done today. Uh, tomorrow is our last session. Tomorrow afternoon, actually it's at noon, and my wife is going to be sharing uh, out of her experience, what God showed her and shared with her, um, uh, there's just been so much God has been doing deep down within her. And Scott, you heard today uh, as uh, we were all together, uh, yes. the, the depth of uh, uh, wisdom and revelation that God has been speaking to her personally about this season uh, as she was diagnosed with a brain tumor and um, uh, possible MS. Uh, but she's going to share um, tomorrow at noon, and then we're going to pray for everybody uh, as we do each each month. And uh, and so we encourage you uh, to, uh, to be with us our last session tomorrow at noon. Um, if you have your communion elements, um, Go ahead and, and get the bread. The bread is the body that was broken uh, for our healing. The, uh, the actual purpose of uh, the bread is to connect to the body and the, the cup is uh, for our forgiveness. And uh, it is his blood that was shed for us. And as I've said every night, it's our vaccination. It's a reminder that we are covered. It's a reminder that we are in covenant. Uh, it's a reminder that we are not under the curse uh, and no plague can come nigh our dwelling. And so uh, we take that tonight in Jesus' name. Uh, eat, the, eat the bread and, and drink the cup. God bless you in the name of the Lord. I release the blessing of the Lord upon you. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. The Lord give you peace tonight. I thank you, God, for this uh, Zoom of a room and this solemn assembly of prayer and the church that you, God, are rebuilding and reestablishing in us. I ask you, God, to do exceeding abundantly above what we can ask or think in this season. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, so tomorrow is our last day, and, uh, and we will start probably at noon. And I uh, give you the time to wake up or get up or do our morning stuff, but not take up all of your day. Tomorrow will be done by one. I'm going to, um, as I said, noise going to open up and she's going to share uh, what's on her heart. And then we're going to pray for everybody prophetically. Um, if you haven't gotten your book, Church Without Spot or Wrinkle, um, it's on the way if you've ordered it. If you haven't ordered it, you can online. Also, tomorrow you'll be able to uh, get all the teachings that have been given in this course and, uh, and then uh, all the, uh, the videos from my time in Turkey together with what I've done over the last uh, 15 or 20 years in outreaches and and Ten Crusades, all of it's in one um, online course called Church Without Spot or Wrinkle. And it's the companion online course for uh, the book. And I've included the teachings from this week in that. And, uh, and that will, and you can get that for $99. It's a 12 video course uh, that is centered around relaunching the church uh, with God's vision and with the word of God. And so uh, that will be available for tomorrow, um, uh, from, from tomorrow on. God bless you guys. Have a blessed night. I'll be in uh, the uh, When You Pray Say page. I'm going to uh, get
get um, a question up from tonight and uh, engage you. I'll uh, tag all of you guys, and if you uh, uh, are um, able to get on that page, please get on that page and uh, let me know what you take 